Is that a new picture frame in the background? Or is that a pirate ship? I just I just noticed that. Nice. Is that a schooner or what would I it's hard to tell on these cameras, but Oh, you can't hear me either. This is I, I just realized you can't hear me either. So that's even yeah, better. I took but my, I was like, it's Yeah. I, I don't know what it is, but my wife got it for me for Father's Day. Did you find it like a yard sale, like around your <laughs> it's like vintage and it's like painted on wood? It's pretty sweet. Oh man, I can't wait to see it in person. It's hard to tell over these cameras. I'm gonna be spending a lot more time in here with you lot. Because I love it in here. I fucking love it! This was insane. There was some property around me that got bought a year ago for like, I don't know, $500,000, $600,000 was relisted nine months later for 1.6 million three weeks after that was cut down to 900,000 <laughs> i was like what is, like <laughs> i mean absolutely wild why you would you list know. for 1.6 and then three weeks later cut to 900 like it's all these psychological bi biases, right? And anchoring and everything. I wish, I wish I wasn't this way, but nothing pisses me off more than when I look at the housing pricing history or somebody bought a house and in less than a year, they've done nothing, no renovations, whatever. And then he lists for an astronomically higher price. Now I shouldn't have that anchoring bias and the market dictates what somebody willing to buy it for, but nothing pisses me off more than no, they, they've done no value exchange and then they just want a higher price. Yeah. Yeah, so a couple, going back, a couple to... lots around me that are that are doing that right now, and I'm waiting for them to come back down to earth. But yeah, I think. Um, by the way, so so right, I use sort of two extremes of how big the mortgage could be versus how small it could be. Like there is that fifty fifty too, which is like okay, take right. half Habsies. half the money in bonds, halvesies, right? And you go okay, am, <laughs> yeah. I, am I if I do five hundred thousand uh, as cash collateral to get another five hundred thousand of treasury futures, like am I actually really running a big risk? I mean, the right. the amount of the outsized move you would need to see in bonds at that point would be so astronomical for you to eat through uh, that exposure. That's probably a, a risk I'm willing to take. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way to think about it. I also want to come back to your, your 10 units, 10 stocks, whatever. And if we're allowed privates, um, just for funsies, I'm going Eldridge Industries. Like... Todd Bully's never taken our money, but man, it would be fun to invest alongside them and just be buying sports teams and just random shit here and there that oh, are just I didn't like even think about sports teams. Yeah, I did. I, I guess I did keep it in my head limited to things I actually could get investments in, right? Yeah, but sports well, sports you, teams is a fun one. Well, you could probably get access via um, Redbird, and I'm gonna probably get the name wrong, but like was it like Aptos or whatever that buys the secondary? They buy minority interests. Um, so, I mean, you could get access, but like, I just think about what Todd Bowley is doing at Eldridge and like how he owns multiple sports teams and multiple ge geographies and just, you know, buys really interesting shit. And like that excites me on that, that private side related to that though. I was listening to a podcast the other day about the PE firm that bought Breitling and I, I should rewind, I should rewind this so I don't, don't spew uh, false information. But one thing that caught my attention was they said that the the difference between the UK and the US in the luxury watch market, and they define luxury as anything over $5,000, is that you know the US market's five times the size of the UK market, but is only buying like 20% of luxury watches that the UK market is. And I thought that was an outrageous kind of like That's number of statistics. So I should probably go back and re-listen re to that. But I, I'm pretty sure that's what they said. All right, Jason, you, you have a choice of putting your money, locking it up in T-bills for a decade or a diversified luxury watch collection. So what they talked about in the podcast too, which you and I agree with, is like they found that the people that own luxury watches also own an Apple watch. So it's a yes and scenario because they treat luxury watches like male jewelry now not mm -hmm. as in the functionality of the watch because they can get much better functionality of an Apple watch. Um, if we're going on the dip in prices and everything, that's a T bills first. Oh man. 
that's tough. I, I mean, I, I once I, I would want to be a, a douche and go, I'll take my uh, my yield off of teals and I'll buy luxury watches. So like that's <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the way I do. What, what would you do in that scenario? I think I know what you do, but maybe not. So I think of T bills as like being of at least historically in the U.S. a very coarse inflation hedge. People always think, oh, you, nominal bonds are an inflation hedge, but historically the way the Fed has reacted and, and the way you can roll your T-bills, they've actually been a pretty decent way of maintaining your purchasing power parity. Everyone yeah. always talks about, oh, the U.S. dollar is down so much over the last 100 years. No, you, you don't ever just hold dollars. Like You would put them at very least in the risk-free asset T-bills yeah. and they, you've maintained your purchasing power. So from that perspective, I go, okay, do I think, you know, how diversified could I get with, you know, I don't know, let's say you choose 10 watches. Um, do I think I can choose 10 watches that are going to maintain, not just maintain, but like maintain with inflation over the next decade? That's tough. That's tough, right? You start to say, okay, I could probably pick a couple classic looking things. I'd actually probably want to not buy anything currently out. All right. I'd want to buy stuff that's already classic. So my thinking here goes back to the conversation we had about art, which is if you buy a Monet, you actually don't expect a very high return on a Monet at this point because it's a well-established artist. You know, you might expect two or three percent per year versus there's a much greater risk premium if you buy a modern artist. Yeah. Um, and, and sort of as you walk your way back, the more established an artist is, the less risky the purchase the lower the expected return. I think I would probably do the same thing with a watch, which is like, I would try to look for very well-defined classics that have been classics for 10 or 15 years. Like, you know, uh, as a very maybe uh, easy example, uh, if I was going to have to go like Rolex, like a Rolex Hulk. I'm not sure a Rolex Hulk. Like that, that maybe that would be a little bit more extreme, but like Patek, you could buy a couple of like in that range of like, there are some Pateks that I just don't think are going to be that'll, that'll maintain their status um, for the next decade. So that's the way I would think about approaching it. But again, like my passion for watches, I'd have to really do some research as to like what I think are existing classics that'll stay classics. Okay. Whenever, uh, I hear your beloved Breitling. It always just makes me think of uh, Rich Homie Quan, and he's like that. That custom Breitling make you feel some type. Now, first of, way. of all, I didn't even bring up Breitling. I know. I just was like, you I keep just bringing it up. Breitling marinades, but I know your love of Breitling. But my, which I, it's, by the it's way, not I, I love Breitling. My love of Breitling. Too. My love of Breitling. My favorite watch that I own is a Breitling, but it's a vintage Breitling from 1992 that just like. No one, I just, I like it because it's got such a classic watch look. I can dress it up. I can dress it down. No one knows what it is. It's small. It's not showy. I just love like the very old vintage look of it. It just so happens it is a Breitling. Well, that's what I'm saying. Aesthetically, you and I tend to like uh, Breitling, IWC, Panerai, like the much more simple watches. Um, yep. But like, I think you have a great point about, especially the Rolex that get like really hot, whether it's a Hulk or a Pepsi or whatever, like that, that wouldn't make me nervous. It would be hard in this scenario. I would like, I'd probably want to go all Patex, like, cause they t seem, yeah. seem to hold their value more than anything else. But at the same time, like, cause like the Rolex is, uh, you and I have talked about before, there used to be, and it probably still is an antique shop on Newberry street in Boston, where I used to buy like vintage Rolexes. And I used to have like stuff like that. I want to say it was like 1940s. Afghan Air Force Rolex, but I would get it for like a few hundred bucks. So right. that's why you're saying like Rolex is producing such large quantities that it would make me nervous buying Rolexes. And like you said, some of those Pateks might come down in value, but I might I might buy ten Pateks and like by the and way, just and roll with that. Here's something we didn't talk about: Are you getting it gray market? Yeah, because th because that's a very different price, right? If if you said, right. okay, Corey, you can buy a, a Rolex sub yeah, from a dealer, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd be like, all right, you want to? I know now I and I'm going <laughs> to sell a gray market. Great, I got it sixty percent off. You know, fifty yeah, percent off. Exactly. Compared exactly. To, so like that, there's a big premium built in there. If I have to buy them gray market, yeah, like I, I sort of think like to your to your point there. I think the the Pepsi is classic, but like a Rolex sub, they're making a lot. And is someone going to, in 10 years, want a 2023 Rolex sub? Is there anything special about a 2023 Rolex sub? 
no you know yeah and like we said the volume they're producing but i want to come back to you know you brought up earlier zero coupon bonds and that made me think about uh buffett again and for those that don't know buffett and said ted saidi had this great bet about hedge funds and and the broad market um back in the around 2007 i want to say yeah. i you know i i don't want to get dive deep into it but i'm not um, I'm not a fan of the parameters that Ted Saidi's allowed this was Buffett the, to have. This was the dumbest bet in the world, which by I the way, one of, one of those, like um, you ever have those moments where you're sitting there, you're like, Oh, this is my life. I, I didn't real, I knew about that bet when I was young, like 2007, I was when yeah. I was coming into the industry, I found myself like at a table years later sitting with Ted and I didn't even realize that he was the one who had made yeah. the bet with Warren Buffett. And I was like, Oh, that was you. Like, God, I forget all the life. time. I forget all the time that it's him too. But, uh, but mm. the most interesting part of the bet, if anybody digs into it, is like they actually held it in zero coupon bonds. They put up the collateral in zero, and those did better than anything, anything else they they invested. And I think eventually they flipped it into Berkshire stock, and the charities did much better. Right. But it was interesting. Like you're you're pairing with zero coupon bonds before the other the other weird detail about Buffett that made me think about because we were talking about longevity and everything is like, have you ever read like Snowball and everything? Like he. He used to experiment with like crazy diet and fasting and all that sort of stuff and try to like lose like 30 pounds in a month, like through fasting and everything. So he's not always just been like the, the hamburglar. He's a crazy character. Uh, that There was that what was an HBO documentary yeah. that that was on him. My wife watched it. And at the very end of the documentary is him singing over the rainbow, which my wife then recorded and used as her ringtone. <laughs> and i was like she has no special connection to warren couldn't give a shit about berkshire hathaway couldn't even tell you what value investing is but just thought this old man singing somewhere over the rainbow was like i don't know endearing and so used it as her ringtone i think she's but then uh there's something i, I want to bring up with that and then we'll get back to like the longer term bets is like you were talking about the matthew mcconaughey thing and as i was listening to other podcasts is like you know as we know, the Buff Dog has had a terrible diet. Um, you know, shout out to Bill Bruce for the, for the Buff Dog comment. Um, the but, Buff Dog. You know, I I was listening to another podcast. So I was like, you know, back when you know we were athletes and like I was a college athlete in the late nineties. It's like we knew what nothing we, what we know today. Athlete. You were an athlete. But we know nothing. We know nothing about like nutrition. Do you, you think know, we know anything now? Like, do you like? Do you really think no. we're that much no. smarter? <laughs> no. As I always, I was always telling my sister is like, you know, we think we're at the forefront of technology and, and you know, I'm such an a-hole that I always say she doesn't know that she could end up being the butcher of Miami a hundred years from now. Right. Cause she does hysterectomies. Like for all we know now, we have no idea. Is, is that the equivalent of drilling holes in heads to relieve headache pressure? Or, I always bring up to her, uh, Ignatius Silvice, right? He was the one that figured out that you should probably wash your hands after working on cadavers before you deliver babies. But he figured this out before germ disease was prevalent but like you just don't none of us know anything and it's it's, it's unbelievable extreme hubris to like think that we we know everything now especially scientifically and medically like or as we we could easily speculate in 100 years from now we're going to be like wait chemotherapy like you just you just firebomb the whole entire body and just hope for I the know. best but anyway so like the, it's interesting just think about the nutritional front though of like did we not know now? Do we know better now? And then as you know, what, what drives me nuts is when they have like these elite athletes and everybody's like, look at their diet. They're vegan or they're this or they're that or like or um, a lot of uh, Mayweather is known for eating hamburgers at two in the morning. It's like these people are elite extreme athletes. Yes. I'm not sure it matters what they do versus what we do. The, well, to that point, right, there's there's like a selection bias element to it as well. Yeah. Right. A survivorship so, bias. Yeah. The survivorship bias. Absolutely. Like. You know, you look at personal trainers and people go, oh, they're like, they look like that because they work out like, no, they're personal trainers because they look like that. Like it, it, you know, it's like they, they happen to be really good at being in shape. And so this was a natural career trajectory. What they do won't necessarily work for the average person who didn't choose that career trajectory because they don't aren't, they don't naturally get in shape easily. One of the things I've always thought is like, did people many years ago know that smoking would cause horrible forms of cancer and just did it anyway. And I think about that every time I'm putting a scoop of protein powder, like into a <laughs> shake and I'm like, I know this is going to give me cancer eventually. Like the, <laughs> the, the fake sugars. 
every time I pour myself like a rum and coke or something, I'm like, this is going to kill me. But you want to know what? Like, if every time I do it, I take a minute off my life, is it worth it for the, I don't know, maybe, you know, present Corey is trading in future Corey. Yeah, that's that's my favorite uh, thing to wrap my head around all the time. We're constantly thinking about it as like future self versus present self and the and the trade-offs and usually how they're <laughs> they're they're at odds with each other. I don't know. Like to me, like and we'll get back to finance in a minute, is like it really bothers me the idea of like my, our modern cohort, especially Californians, younger, you know, Tex, you know, Austin, that the whole that whole cohort that's like anti-drinking these days. And I get that like weed or microdosing is allegedly much better for you health wise but your life sucks like i mean i i didn't want to be hung over like last week or everything and i had hangovers and i hated them but man there is something about having a cocktail or a glass of wine sometimes in the right environment with the right people that it's worth taking those years off my life and i couldn't imagine giving those away well and i also i'm a believer like you look at those blue what do they call them the blue areas where you get yeah. these centennials Blue Zones, Japan, I think Sardinia is one of them, right? And, and Hawaii. And you, you start to look at the patterns there and you go, these people aren't like monks. Like you look at what actually was important and seems to be important. Like the patterns are like a strong social life and being active, right? So you look, I, I was reading one study, I think it was about Sardinia where it's like these, these elderly people, they still walk miles a day. They have gardens. They get up, they drink tea, they walk into town, they they sit down at the bar and they have wine and they mm -hmm. talk to a bunch of people, they walk home, they have people that check in on them if they don't show up places, like they have the social structure, they have things to look forward to, but it, they're not sitting there like not drinking wine, not like it's not cutting stuff out of their life, it's making sure they're appreciating and enjoying and having something to live for. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, you should have a bottle of wine every single day. Like there's a balance here, right? But if that social aspect of drinking gives you something to look forward to, like that's that seems to be correlated with a higher quality of life and longevity. So you touched on many things there. And I want to say it's Oscar Wilde, or we contribute everything to Oscar Wilde. As he said, uh, I will not waste one minute of my life trying to prolong it. And the blue zones me off this is going to be another one of those rabbit holes that you're going to be surprised that i actually know about a little bit it's I'm like not surprised. First I, of all, I don't get surprised uh, first of all the cdc measurements of health span or lifespan are total bullshit the confidence interval is so high that they just stack rank them and always put the us at like 20 to 30 because it helps you know sell more projects for the cdc and you really don't know it's like what's the infant mortality rates in japan how do they measure it all this stuff is just kind of made up and then the blue zones uh, also kind of pissed me off. Uh, just some anecdotes about that. It was Crete, I think, versus Sardinia, what you're talking about. And in Crete, like you said, not only is it, it's it's a mountainous region, so they're walking around, but they're drinking lots of wine. And everybody attributes a Mediterranean diet. But what I think you nailed is the sense of community more and sense of purpose and living a much more slower paced and more relaxed life. But what people take, they don't account for on Crete is their Greek Orthodox diet. And they have many fasting periods to the Greek Orthodox calendar. And it might be more what they don't eat with the fasting than what they do eat with like the Mediterranean seafood, right. olive oil diet. The other thing in the, the Japanese sense, it's Okinawans. And so everybody's like, oh, they're eating fish and all this stuff and rice. It's like, no, the Okinawans eat uh, a lot of uh, pork fat, pork belly and and the purple uh, Okinawan potatoes. And so like, once again, people aren't digging into it. The one that really pisses me off, though, is uh, Loma Linda in California is one of the blue zones. And it's because the Seventh Day Adventists and they go, oh, it's because like they don't have like caffeine or alcohol or whatever. No, it's going back to once again, a sense of strong community, but more importantly, the SDAs have always highly focused on hospitals. So they're basically, mm. you know, just they're keeping these people alive in hospitals. Right. And that's what's increasing right. that that statistical significance of their longevity. So and, you know, it, everything is, you know, a layer of bullshit on top of a layer of bullshit. But like once again, we're both going to die. So it's like, how do you how do you live while you're while you're waiting to die, I guess? Well, if there's any way to conclude this episode. It's with that statement. Everything is a layer of bullshit on top of a layer of bullshit. That's it. I don't think we can say anything else. I do. I want to touch on one thing, though, uh, because you talk about this 10 year thing. And this, speaking of like layers of bullshit, it made me think about, OK, over a 10 year time horizon. I was thinking about uh, Mike Green and Michael Cow, right? Both guys yeah. who used to work at Canyon Parks, both uh, exceedingly brilliant guys. Um, 
they're basically not, I don't know if it's necessarily a two-way argument, but they're basically have an argument where Michael Cal thinks there's going to be persistent inflation. And I think he's even put a number on it in like the nine to 12 range. And then Mike Green thinks that uh, inflation is coming back down. Um, and we're still on that long heart arc of like a disinflationary environment. So my questions are twofold. One is, do you have a bet on where we're going to be in 10 years? And then the second one is, I do not, maybe you can help me with this. I do not understand how people have the confidence in prognosticating about where like inflation rates or anything are going to be. I mean, yeah, you collect the data and you then have an opinion, but then to be so confident in your opinion and only in hindsight will we say one of them was a genius and one of them was an idiot. We don't Sorry. know which ones yet. I don't know if you're saying this because of something I tweeted last night. No, I didn't. I haven't been looking at Twitter. Sorry. So, so you know, one of my favorite things to do is like start with the assumption markets are efficient, right? Yeah. And this, this is, it was sort of like a macro thread boys poke the bear type thing. But, but my, the thing I was saying is let's assume the market's efficient. It means, it means sort of two things for macro. One or two extremes, at least. One, yes, you can predict the market cycle perfectly. But if the market is efficient, it means that you can't figure out what assets are going to do well in the cycle. Like you can't take advantage of that information in the market. It's either already priced in by everyone else, or there's no way for you to actually know what's going to do well in different parts of the cycle. The other extreme is you can't forecast the cycle at all, even if you know exactly what will do well. So for example, you might say, if, if I knew there's a recession coming, I know with 100% certainty stocks will do poorly. But if the market's efficient, that would imply that you can't know with certainty whether they're, they're the market, um, whether a recession is coming. Now, market efficiency does not extend to uh, the real economy. So I tend to be a believer that people probably have more, well, you would hope people have more insight into forecasting what's going to happen in the real economy. Like, is there a higher probability of um, inflation or higher probability of recession or economic growth? Though I will say the track records of macro prognosticators <laughs> aren't great there. But right, it's not like... Um, there, there are feedback loops and behavioral feedback loops that can make things real, but you don't get the, necessarily the same like front-running effects. Like just because you and I both believe there's going to be economic growth, doesn't like negate economic growth from happening. Like the way if you and I, if everyone believes markets are going to go up, well, then people are going to reprice markets up immediately, and and that's all already priced in. All right, long way of saying. Like, what do you even do with that information? Like, even if Michael is right, or, or either Michael's right. I like, love how they're both Michael's. So I love that. Even right? if Michael's right. Even if Michael's yeah. right, like, what what then are you doing with that information? Like, okay, is it, do you have a fundamentally different view than the market? And there is an instrument that allows you to take advantage of that? I don't have a view on inflation. Like, 10 years, that have a view, a 10-year view on inflation you have to be talking about strong structural forces that you don't think are going to be broken um, and you don't think are going to be overwhelmed by cyclical forces. And I'm just, I'm not convinced looking at history that anyone has a good uh, method of predicting that sort of thing. Like you could have all sorts of innovations that could suddenly come out of nowhere that could be strong inflationary or deflationary forces. Well, I think you you nailed it, but what you and I always come back to is like, what instruments are you using to express this trade? Can you get some asymmetry and convexity? And then show me the rest of your portfolio. That's all you and I both know. It's like, great, you have these opinions. Um, you know, what is the probabilistic weighting of those opinions? Can you build an interesting way of expressing that opinion? Um, with asymmetry and convexity, do you have to nail it perfectly? Or do you have a kind of broad range of outcomes where you could you could express that asymmetrically, which is usually pr pretty rare. And then more importantly, what does the rest of the portfolio look like? And what does the rest of the portfolio look like in case you're wrong? Um, so I, but that's, I saw not, one of the, that's not fun, right? <laughs> yeah, one of the interesting ones I, I've seen actually, I think it was SockGen, their quantitative investment strategies group wrote about this was, if you wanted to make a bet on inflation being higher, what you do is you create a basket of inflation sensitive stocks that tend to do well. And then you can use like a trend following strategy on that basket of stocks to try to create an asymmetric call option profile. Um, 
and and basically you get a bank to help you turn that into a swap is the concept and then you get a ton of leverage on it so so it's like you know or you just yeah. get them to give you an explicit otc call option on the basket right so i think there are like very creative ways you might be able to do this but to your point like okay the michaels have different views what's the market's view and what are the instruments priced at that allow you to say okay i actually the market's pricing in four and so much certainty that upper tail isn't going to happen that I think that that outside, you know, whatever bet I can make has has a decent amount of asymmetry to it. In which case, you can say, fine, like that's your view. Like, um, I don't actually have an issue with with that, but I think it has to be connected to the trade. Just to say inflation is going to be high is like, well, who gives a shit? What are you going to do with that information? Yeah. <laughs> Green jacket, gold jacket, who gives a shit? Uh, but like, just speaking of your stock trend, it made me think though, like, with is this a barbell for you? It's like, you know, allegedly, you know, classical CTA trend following allegedly has, you know, nice convexity to an inflationary environment, doesn't get absolutely destroyed in a disinflation environment, but maybe you barbell that with like tech, high flying tech for a disinflationary environment. And that's kind of your barbell. And, and then maybe you're, you know, rebalancing bands between theirs. It, it, that's a simplistic version of kind of what you're saying, right? I don't know. Maybe we should stack it, Jason. <laughs> well, as, as you know, you could stack, uh, I, some people talk about stacking. I don't know what those who those people are, but uh, yeah, especially with CTAs, you can get that capital efficient stacking in there. But I think that might uh, wrap up our macro corner for the day. The other, I have a personal question for you. So, you know, we're talking about this summer travel schedule. And by summer travel schedule, I mean mine, which is uh, allowing it or disallowing us not to have these live versions then that we're accustomed to for the booty crew. So we apologize for that. But at the same time, so uh, on my next trip around the world i'm not saying gonna say exactly where because then we could have fun with it is i really 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 want to take one week off i haven't taken a week off in five years but i need advice on how to do it like i'm thinking do i put a vacation responder on my email and everything but i hate vacation responders because i feel like it doubles the amount of email and just makes things worse so how do you take a week off well, two two things really quickly. One, I, I love that we're recording these episodes early and we're recording long ones with the intention that they could be broken up into multiple <laughs> episodes and then they just don't get broken up. So we're just like <laughs> extra recording shit. Um, we're going an hour and a half here instead of the usual hour, just putting more burden on us. I, I don't enjoy taking the time off. Like my, when I go on a vacation with my wife, she is like, I'm going to turn the phone off. I'm turning my computer off. I'm ignoring email. That stresses me out. And people might say, Corey, you're addicted. I, I will turn on an auto away message, but I just every day want to spend 15 minutes clearing my email out so that Clearing when I come up. back, yeah, I don't exactly. have 10,000 unread messages. Exactly. So I, I, the whole idea of me of like taking a week off, I, it just means different things. Like it doesn't mean I'm not going to check my email or respond to texts or like make sure if there's an emergency, I'm not available. Like, I'm going to be there and I'm going to, if someone sends me an email, I'll say, Hey, uh, like I'm out on vacation. I'll get back to you, you know? Yeah. But it actually makes vacation more stressful for me if I yes. try to not do anything. Well, that's my, my OCD about like inbox zero or inbox hygiene. Like, that's why I want to at least check it every couple of days. Like you said, just to clear it out. So I'm not just coming back to a mess because then I'm going to be thinking the whole time about coming back to that mess. But there could be that one email that sets you off on a spiral where then you have trouble sleeping at night or enjoying, you know, staying by the pool, having a cocktail. You're thinking about that has this definitely happened to me. That has right. absolutely <laughs> happened to me. I don't know. I don't know if there's a good answer to this other than my dad just recently retired and he went on a, uh, he's also a scuba diver. And so he went on a scuba diving trip to Micronesia for a few weeks. I go, how did it feel to know that there was like no clients, nothing to come back to. You weren't going to come back to chaos because you took like two weeks off. I'm like, I, I'm not sure I'll ever know what that feeling's like. My my father, when before he retired, this was back in the mid-90s when he was running his own company, right? Very high strung. But that was still an age like, yeah, email had started and, and he actually had a like a car phone. But we used to go up to New Hampshire on a, uh, on a lake and there was only, I think, two people at his company that had the phone number of that New Hampshire house. So there was like, he knew every weekend, no one could get in touch with him unless it was a complete, like everything is burning down emergency. And I don't think we live in that world anymore. 
like you've got a you got a cell phone in your pocket that connects everywhere wherever you go um you know it's just a, it's a different age i do think there's something to the idea potentially of like hiring i wonder if you can get like a one week personal assistant and let them mm. get access to Great, your yeah. email and say you're going to you're going to sort through this every day and you're going to filter out you know the most important stuff for me that's like i actually have to address but then you know in the back of your head someone's actually like you're not going to come back to thousand red messages it's a question of whether you trust that person though can you train them to 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 read it the same way you would that's an interesting, I, I actually can't do it. I think I have somebody on my team that can do it. And that it did make me think about what you're talking about. It's like, hopefully we're both to the place where we're building great teams at our businesses. And then that's why you're not, I'm not necessarily worried about coming back to chaos anymore. It's just all the little things and the little, little details and maybe all those emails that I have to clear out and decipher, you know, on that spectrum of importance. But I think now, you know, both of us are a place like you build a good team around you, like a, a good team and systems in place. Like you don't have to really worry about any sort of like emergencies, right? There shouldn't, if I take two off, there should be zero emergencies for me to handle, especially 100%. in my function and role now there's, there's nothing for me to do. Like, let's be honest, I'm, I'm, my, my, I'm for, my team exactly, is better without exactly. me. <laughs> exactly. They like it when uh, I go on vacation. Exactly. So, uh, that reminded me of, and by the way, I should send it to you. Nick Bear had Sam Parr on his podcast. And that's one of the things they were talking about when they hired a CEO. They were both kind of like disappointed because they thought their team was going to be like, no, don't hire a CEO. They're like, oh, no, this is going to so much better without you as a bottleneck. And they were both yeah. kind of like butthurt about it. But that was an actually an interesting podcast I'll send to you. Um, and then I want to wrap up with I want to give a huge shout out um, to, you know, OG Booty Crew member Javi in Madrid. Good friend. Great guy. I'm actually a huge fan of his. But he just hooked up Tyler with a full itinerary for when he heads off to Spain. So once again, That's the pirates awesome. are the pirates are invading Spain. Um, you know, we'll be there. Unfortunately, the uh, large male pirate will not be invading Spain with or Europe with us. But Javi gave, yeah, he gave. Not only did he give Tyler like full itinerary, and he said he fulfilled his pirate pinky promise, which he went above and beyond and more so. But I'll have to remember exactly the quote. But he gave, he gave Tyler. He goes, "Here's the uh, pirate." private line in case you give him get in trouble and like gave him basically like his mobile number in case he gets in trouble in spain like he can get him out get That's him out awesome. of jail free card and i was like that we got to think of what that is yeah the, the the pirate private line um but once again this has been pirates of finance where we rarely talk about finance at all nothing we say is investment advice we hope it's for entertainment purposes only and that we entertain you but that pirate pinky promise is to, to slam that subscribe button tell all your friends about it um other than that, Corey, I don't know when we're going to record next or where I'm going to be, but we we want to keep putting out these shows. Shout out to Booty Crew. We appreciate your patience. We we, we love and miss the uh, comment section. Um, anything else you want to add? No, that is it. I hope everyone is having a, a wonderful summer. Uh, we are recording on Wednesday, June 21st, which means I believe it is the summer solstice, Jason. So um, this is the turning point. Winter is coming. Well, more importantly, for those of you listening, Corey has a fresh haircut and a fairly clean shave. So I I don't know what that's indicative of. And is that a new uh, picture frame in the background? Or is that a pirate ship? I just I just noticed that. I was wondering if you're going to notice it. Hold on. Nice. Is that a schooner or what would I it's hard to tell on these cameras, but Oh, you can't hear me either. This is I, I just realized you can't hear me either. So that's even yeah, better. I but my, I was like, it's Yeah. Like, I, I don't know what it is, but my wife got it for me for Father's Day. Did you find it like a yard sale like around your <laughs> it's like vintage and it's like painted on wood? It's pretty sweet. Oh man, I can't wait to see it in person. It's hard to tell over these cameras. Yeah. Uh but but with with that uh art and and, and decor decoration. Uh, we're out. We look forward to seeing you again. And thank you for joining us on uh, the old Pirates of Finance.